You've just robbed an ice cream shop in the city of Graftopia and are fleeing the scene of the crime. The police are just around the corner. Can you outrun them? Or should you give up and enjoy your looted ice cream? There's some surprising and compelling graph theory that go into answering that question. Cops and Robbers is played on a graph, a collection of vertices connected by edges. Throughout the episode, we'll assume that the graph is finite and connected, meaning that any two vertices are joined by a path of edges. The game begins by placing a cop and a robber each on a single vertex. We say it occupies that vertex. They alternate moving along the edges from a vertex to a neighboring vertex. Or on any given turn, the player can choose not to move, to stay where they are. We'll assume that the cop always goes first. If, eventually, the cop lands on the robber's vertex, the game is over. We say that the game is a win for the cop. But if the robber can avoid the cop indefinitely, we say that the game is a win for the robber. Cops and Robbers is kind of like a crime drama remake of Pac-Man. We'll define a graph to be a cop-win graph if the cop has a winning strategy. That is, they can always catch the robber no matter how the robber chooses to move. Analogously, we could define a graph to be a robber-win graph if the robber can always evade the cop forever, no matter how the cop chooses to move. The cop selects their starting position first, and then the robber selects their starting position. In other words, the starting positions are part of the strategy. So, for example, the robber will never choose to start immediately next to the cop, unless they're forced to. How can you tell if a graph is a cop-win or a robber-win? Here are three graphs. A cycle, where all the vertices are connected in a circle. A complete graph, where each vertex is connected to every other vertex. And a tree, which contains no cycles. I'd encourage you to pause here and consider what each player's best strategy is for each graph. Who wins, the cop or the robber? On the cycle, the robber can always run in the opposite direction as the cop, and he'll never get caught. So it's a robber win graph. Any cycle with four or more vertices is a win for the robber. What about the complete graph? Well, that's an immediate win for the cop. No matter where the robber and the cop start, their two vertices will be connected by an edge, which the cop will move along in the first turn to win. Finally, any tree is also a cop win graph. But what about this graph? Is it a cop win or robber win? Or this graph? It's not always easy to tell. We could try to figure out all the possible strategies for the cops and the robbers, but that sounds complicated. We'd really like to have a general characterization, an easy way to tell if a graph is a cop win or robber win. Let's start that investigation by considering what has to happen in order for the cop to capture the robber. On the final turn, the cop will move along one edge to land on the same vertex as the robber. And on the robber's last turn, immediately before being caught, there must have been nowhere to go. Any vertex the robber could have moved to, any one that it's connected to by an edge, must also be connected to the cop's vertex by an edge, since we're assuming the robber is captured on the next turn and that he would avoid capture, if possible. The robber would like to avoid being in such a position. Formally, we'll define a pitfall to be a vertex whose neighborhood, including the vertex itself, is entirely covered by another vertex. That other vertex is attacking the pitfall. So we'll call it the attack vertex. In other words, the cop is automatically going to win if the robber's vertex is a pitfall. It and all the vertices that are adjacent to it are also adjacent to the cop's vertex, the attack vertex. For example, these are the pitfalls in the tree and these are the associated attack vertices where the cop would stand to capture a robber on the pitfall vertex. On the complete graph, every vertex is a pitfall and every vertex is an attack vertex for every pitfall. On the cycle, there's no pitfalls. A graph must have a pitfall to be a cop win graph. It's the only way for capture to happen. But the opposite isn't true. Just because a graph has a pitfall doesn't mean it's cop win. This graph has a pitfall, but the robber can avoid entering it and escape the cop forever. Intuitively, that's the big idea. Since the robber is acting strategically, he will avoid entering a pitfall, which means we can ignore them entirely. Effectively, the game will play out on a smaller graph, one where we've removed the pitfall and all the adjacent edges. We can just analyze this new, simpler graph. 
Let's make that intuition more precise in the form of a lemma. Removing a pitfall and its adjacent edges will not change who wins the game. Whoever is going to win on the larger graph with the pitfall will also win on the smaller graph without the pitfall. I'd encourage you to pause here and consider how to prove the lemma. There's several different proofs, but perhaps the simplest one uses the fact that it's easier to show that adding a pitfall to a graph doesn't change the winner. That's equivalent to what we wanna show. If adding a pitfall doesn't change who wins, then removing a pitfall also doesn't change who wins. We'll start with some graph, let's call it G, and we'll add a pitfall. Let's call this new graph H. The pitfall we added must have an attack vertex, and that attack vertex is part of the original graph G. We don't really know anything about the structure of G, the original graph, but let's assume that it's cop win. The cop has a winning strategy on G, a predetermined set of rules that result in the cop winning. We can extend this to a winning strategy for the cop on H. If the robber is not on the pitfall, so he's inside the smaller graph G, then the cop uses her original strategy on G. But if the robber enters the pitfall, the cop just implements the strategy as if the robber's on the attack vertex, which is part of the original graph G. This strategy ensures the cop will win on the new graph H and proves that H is cop win. A nearly identical argument shows that if G is robber win, so the robber has a winning strategy on G, then we can extend this winning strategy to H and prove that H is robber win. Therefore, adding or removing a pitfall doesn't change the winner. Now we know that removing a pitfall and its adjacent edges will not change who wins the game. So let's start removing pitfalls on this graph. If we keep going, removing pitfalls and their adjacent edges, we are eventually left with just a single vertex. Clearly, a single vertex is cop win. The cop and the robber must start on the same vertex, so the game is basically over before it starts. We converted our original graph into a single vertex, a cop win graph, by successively removing pitfalls. And since removing pitfalls doesn't change the winner, our original graph must have also been cop win. What if we'd started with this graph? Then, after removing the pitfalls, we'd be left with this graph. And we know that on the cycle, a graph with no pitfalls, the cop can never trap the robber. This graph must be robber win. Therefore, our original graph must have also been robber win. That's the big theorem. A graph is cop win if it's possible to successively remove pitfalls until you're left with just a single vertex. Otherwise, the graph is robber win. That's an impressive theorem. To determine who wins a game, we just need to check for and remove pitfalls on the graph. This is so much easier than checking all the possible cop strategies and all the possible robber strategies. Since it's so easy for a police department to check if the robber will escape forever, they might wanna try something different on robber win graphs. They might wanna send out more than one cop. On the next episode, we'll explore just that. How many cops does it take to guarantee they'll catch the robber? Hello. I loved all of the creative comments on our episode about higher dimensional tic-tac-toe. Lots of folks pointed to other variants of tic-tac-toe, including Taco Dude, who asked about non-Euclidean tic-tac-toe. Honestly, I'm not sure how that would work, but I'm interested in hearing your suggestions. And Unbox the Black Box mentioned a version where you play on an infinite grid and try to get five in a row. We could also increase the number of players, as many of you suggested, or there's a recursive or nested version of tic-tac-toe called ultimate tic-tac-toe. My favorite variant is to play on different surfaces. Like you could play tic-tac-toe on the surface of a cylinder or on the surface of a torus, a donut. You should give those variants a try. They're all really fun in their own way. And finally, Dr. Who fan pointed out that when we were talking about what could possibly happen in one of the row columns of the chart, so as you move down the column, it starts with a draw and it eventually becomes all wins. We were talking about what's possible to happen in between. We should have said that we can't rule out the possibility of win, draw, win, draw. Because we can rule out the possibility of win, lose, win, lose, which is what I said. All right, thank you. Have a good week.